Overall, we'll be focusing on the concept of services design as it ties back to the text from Chapter 5. The overall agenda for the class is going to be broken down into multiple portions. We'll be focusing on the service economy, characteristics of services, the service design process, tools for service design, as well as latent night analysis for service improvement. And we're going to look at this from a global perspective. Understanding the types of services across a number of different countries in Europe, Asia, and North America. The graph shown marks out the different types of economies within those organizations. For example, services economies within Thailand are predominantly agricultural and services with very little manufacturing. Looking at Taiwan, you see a split between services and manufacturing with very little agriculture. Understanding what is the key drivers within those organizations is critical in terms of understanding how improvements in the service economy will impact productivity and impact the organization and the country. As you see from this graph, we'll be looking at the U.S. economy. 81% of the U.S. economy is driven by services. Manufacturing, 14%. The um, agriculture, 1%, and 4 from other entities. Now these stats are as of 2011, when this text was made available. Recent stats show a similar breakdown, um, and if you were to historically look at numbers um, in, from 50 years ago, um, you would see the agricultural shrinkage. When I am talking about services, it's broken down essentially into four key areas. Services, goods, facilitating services, and facilitating goods. So what do I mean related to services? When I'm talking about services, essentially I'm looking at acts, deeds, or performances. Related to goods, obviously, tangible objects. I'm producing cars. I'm making staplers. I'm selling pens. Facilitating services. What I am doing in terms of selling those goods and services. How am I going out and looking at all the different aspects of the purchase of the goods? And then what is the facilitations of the goods in terms of accompanying all of the service purchases? How am I selling and how am I using? So if you look at the overall continuum, you'll see a number of different items. If we were to look at goods versus services, a number of areas in terms of automotive purchases, rental car purchases, auto repair, what types of different things. So I'm purchasing a car and I need to have it repaired. I'm purchasing a cell phone and I need to update it. I go to the hospital and I need to have support. When I'm looking at characteristics of services, essentially I'm looking at the ability to consume. So I provide professional services as an organization for my team. And we provide help desk, we provide high customer contact. These are areas of work that we're performing. My team does not create cars. We do not build paper airplanes. We provide professional services. We provide tasks and consulting. When we're looking at it from this perspective, essentially you're going to see a lot of that be decentralized. Uh, you consume more services than you do products. You go to a doctor's appointment and visit with your doctor. You are sitting in this lecture and consuming the class. Okay? You're not physically eating an Egg McMuffin. Not that I wouldn't mind eating an Egg McMuffin right now. The output of the services that you receive is variable. You go to a concert. The concert could be three hours long, ten hours long, five hours long. If you're purchasing the goods at the concert, that would be purchasing the concert t-shirt. If I were to look at the service design process, you'll get into all of the different areas in terms of how we are going about the concept of the service to the service delivery. 
For example, if I've decided to build a, um, a new practice related to a tool or a technology, that would serve as my concept. I would like to start a practice um, providing Oracle consulting services. What I would look at would be first who my target customer is and what I want that service experience to be. For example, I want to provide Oracle services for help desk and tier one support calls. So the next thing I would do is I would build a package around those services. I build pricing, I look at different items in terms of what would allow customers to try to buy these services. And I put different specifications together from performance specifications. What are those customer requirements? Do my customers require 24 by 7 support? Do my customers provide five days a week or seven days a week? Then I get into design specifications. What do I need to perform those services? Do I need desks? Do I need phones? Do I need toll-free numbers? What are those items that I need? And how do they fill out into a delivery specification? Scheduled deliverables location. For example, we offer help desk out of our office in Troy, Michigan. We have physical desks with phones and toll-free services. And these are all then tied together to build that component. So, looking at it, there are really three heavy areas that I just mentioned. The concept, the package, and the specifications. The concept is that purpose of that service. What is my target market? I want to provide help desk services for Oracle customers. The service package is going to include all of the different components of that package. And the specifications is going to include everything related to the design and the delivery. And this is best shown from a matrix in terms of customizations to labor intensity. If I'm building a professional service, it's going to be highly labor intensive with a lot of custom configuration. Whereas if I'm getting to the other end of the spectrum with a service factory, you're looking at low-end labor and low amounts of customization with a service shop and mass service in between. What do I mean regarding high and low contact services? When I'm talking about high and low contact services, I'm looking at a number of different items. And I'm going to talk about facilities and quality. So if I have a high contact service, it's going to be something that's convenient to the customer. You know, I'm going to Jiffy Lube. I'm going to meet with the, um, the mechanic who's fixing my car. A low contact service is going to be more um, related to the source. So I do not go to um, the factory where Jiffy Lube is getting their oil from. If we're looking at um, from a facility perspective, high contact service, look at a store, a store like Nordstrom. If you've ever been in Nordstrom, you'll see that the aisles are wide, the lighting is clear, um, it is designed to be palatable for a user. If you look for low contact services, where you're not dealing with lots of salespeople, a good example of this would be BJ's. It's designed for efficiency. It's rows upon rows upon rows, where you a do-it-yourself manner. If we're looking at this from a high contact versus low contact services, the quality control, a lot of it is going to be um, for high contact, a store like Apple, where you have someone helping you up front and seeing you through to make sure that you can leverage the products and services. The, if it's a low contact service, it's going to be more hands off. Same thing related to capacity. Um, you go into a store like Best Buy and you're going to be able to find the printers and the ink and the cartridges that you need. If you go into a smaller store, um, perhaps one of those electronic stores at the airport, you're not going to have a lot of capacity. It's going to be just for the average demand. When you get into it from a skill perspective, you also see worker skills, scheduling, and then the different packages. So if I am going into um, the Apple Store, I'm going to want someone who not only knows, um, knows the, how to service the Apple products, 
but also how to sell them. It needs to be someone who is essentially strong and customer facing. If I have a low contact service where um, perhaps I'm getting my um, computer rebuilt, I'll take it to Best Buy and they have the Geek Squad there and I hand it over and they're not there trying to upsell me on services, they're there just for their technical skills. If you look at things like scheduling from a high contact service, look at um, more high-end places that are accommodating and allow you to build around your schedule versus other organizations where the customer is truly only concerned with the completion date. I need a package delivered by X versus I need the package delivered right now. Additionally, we look at it from a process and a package perspective. If it's high contact, it's really what is in front of the customer. I call it front of the room versus back of the room. So I have, from a service process perspective, people on my team, which meet consistently day to day with the customer and other individuals that work behind the scenes. The services that are done that are high contact are typically things like project management and business analysis. And a lot of my engineers are more low contact because they're basically executing um, with minimal interference from the customers. This allows for packages that um, are worthwhile. We have essentially two. We'll have a fixed price package, which is low contact. You're basically getting a list of set deliverables. And then more custom packages are considered high contact from a service delivery perspective. This concludes part one of today's lecture. Part two, we're getting into the concept of services design. Thank you.